Luke 4, verse 18. I love the scripture. Very powerful, powerful verse. And it's when Jesus announces it, it's the beginning of a new day. So this scripture is the beginning of his ministry, and he's virtually proclaiming this is where God is at right now. And as he speaks the scripture out, he's announcing his ministry. He's announcing the ushering in of a whole new era. There's a whole new season of change coming about. And so here's the scripture, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. He's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me. Uh, In this passage here, Jesus is describing how he's been anointed for a purpose. I find people everywhere want anointing. They want the Holy Ghost to come on them. They want more anointing. But anointing is always for an assignment. The thing that we need to cry out for is for God to enlarge our assignment. And God enlarges our assignment if we are faithful in what He has given us. And so Jesus begins to describe that He's anointed by the Holy Ghost, and then He outlines what His assignment is. And some of you may not, we know the scripture, you're very familiar with the scripture, but I want to open it up in just a slightly different way for you to see that in this uh, outline of Jesus' assignment are progressive steps of healing, of restoring healing, putting vision into people and empowering them to do something for the kingdom of God. Most of us haven't seen it that way. And so let me just outline it quickly for you. And I want to focus just on one aspect of it. And uh, let me just, before I do it, share with you a story of someone that came up one time in an altar call. We're in Australia. And this lady came up in the altar call. I'd been speaking on trauma. And she came up and she said, would you please pray for me? I had a terrible trauma when I was 12 years old. And I said, what happened? She said, well, my father's a very, very wealthy man, a millionaire, multimillionaire. And I was 12 years old and some people broke into our house. And they tied me up and threw me on my bed. And then they had a, a, like a hatchet or a chopper. And they were threatening to chop me up and chop parts of me off unless my father revealed where he had hidden the money. And they beat my father in front of me. And she said he wouldn't tell him where the money was. And she said it was the most horrendous experience I've ever had. He said, although I didn't get physically harmed, It's affected me all my life. And so here she was, a Christian in a church. She's now 35. And she's uh, very highly trained, very highly skilled, got a very high income. She's a single woman. And so I prayed for her. And I prayed that the attachment in her soul to the trauma and the demonic spirits that had come around her life through the trauma, spirits of fear and shock and infirmity would leave her And she literally shook violently as God set her free from the power of that trauma in her life. Then I spoke to her because God gave me two words of knowledge regarding her. And I said, you have problems with money and problems with men, don't you? And she said, that's right. She said, I'm 35. I have an extremely highly paid job and I have no money. I cannot save money. I I just can't seem to save money. And she said, and I've had no success in relationships with men. I said, I'll tell you why. I said, we've just prayed to deal with the trauma that you've gone through. But as a young girl being very vulnerable, there are two things that have happened in your heart that have never been dealt with and are affecting your life. And these two things are, number one, you have formed judgments in your heart. And the judgments you've made are about men and about money. You've made a judgment about men that men are dangerous And then you've made an inner vow, I'll never let any man come near to me. I've got to protect myself. Men are dangerous. So no matter what relationship, no matter what kind of man you have connected with, ultimately what's in your heart has affected that relationship. You perceive they're dangerous because you've made a judgment and therefore you will not get near them. So that's why the relationships are breaking down. You've also made a similar thing about money. Money is dangerous. If you have money, then your life will be in danger. People will try and threaten you and kill you. So you've come to a judgment about money. And you made an inner vow 
I'll make sure I never have money because if I have money, my life will be in danger. So I said, you've made a bitter judgment and you've made an inner vow. These are things in your heart that you've made as a young woman. You've forgotten about them, haven't you? And she said, as you've told me them right now, I remember doing that very thing. I said, well, the judgments have set in, in motion in your life a cycle of reaping. So you've never been able to keep money and you've never been able to keep a relationship with men. And those things need to be broken because they're affecting the course of your life. And so I prayed for her. We broke the bitter judgments against men. See, she'd been hurt by two men, but made judgments about all men. And she'd, uh, the issue of money was her father's money, but now it affected all things to do with money. And so her life was affected by things she'd forgotten she'd even said. She'd made an inner vow, and she'd made a bit of judgment, and now she was reaping in her life an outcome of it. So the issues that she had, she couldn't work out why she couldn't save money, and she couldn't work out why she couldn't have a relationship with men that would work. And the reasons were not something to do with your mind. The reasons were to do with the heart. There were hidden roots that were feeding the issues. So when we face and address issues in our life, it's not just a matter about trying harder. It's not just a matter about working at it. It's not just a matter about, well, I need to do this or do that. You have to track the issue to its roots because often the roots are in the heart and whatever's in your heart will affect the course of your life. And so we prayed. The next day she came up, she said, oh, man, I've already got a plan on how I can get things moving in this area, and, and her life has started on a different journey straight away. And I can share with you story after story. Let me tell you another story about a young man, and uh, he, uh, was, he was trained in university in economics, so he knew finances very well. When he married this young woman, his mother said to the young woman, you better run the finances. He's hopeless with money. And uh, she thought, well, I want him to be the head of the home. And, and uh, she found he was hopeless with money, and money just went nowhere. And so it was true. So she had to take up running the finances. And then we got to talk about it one day. And uh, we talked about it, and I, and I kind of probed a little bit to try and find it. And he said, well, money's bad. Money's evil. I said, oh, where did you learn that? And he, he stopped for a moment. He couldn't think where he'd learned it. And then finally, we had just asked the Holy Spirit to reveal where this thing had come from. And it turns out when he was seven, his father had established a business. And he was away from home all the time. And as a young boy of seven, he looked at what his father was doing. And this is the conclusion he came to, the judgment he made. He concluded that pursuing money destroys or takes away from you the people you love. So therefore, money's evil because it'll take people you love away from you. And so he said, I'll never have money. So no matter how much money he earned, he would just give it away or he'd, whatever it was, it would never last. In other words, it's like water running through him because of what was in his heart. It's no wonder Jesus said it's out of the heart in Matthew chapter 15, uh, out of the heart come the issues that defile your life. And so often, the church is preoccupied with behaviors and doesn't address the heart. And if you don't change the heart, you won't change the behavior. If you don't address what's driving the problem, you can't actually solve the problem. If a problem has a spiritual root, it'll need spiritual power to change it. And so, Wonderful. Jesus gave us all the resources we need. Let's have a look at what he's promised to give us, and then we'll apply it. Okay, so let's have a look. It says, uh, he said, now the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. So the first aspect of Jesus' ministry is to deal with the issue of sin. Sin creates a legal right for evil spirits to access people's lives. You can try to, uh, in various ways, talk yourself out of all of this, but when you look at Jesus' ministry, you find everywhere he went, he preached the gospel, healed the sick, and cast out evil spirits. So an evil spirit is a spirit being that looks for ways to enter people's life. And it can't just get in any way. The, the primary way that evil spirits access a person's life is through legal rights, breaking the laws of God. 
So when you break the law of God, two things happen. One, you set in motion a law of reaping what you've sown. And secondly, you create a legal right for demonic spirits to access your life and eventually to enter your life. A lot of people don't understand that. So they kind of look at religion or the law. They look at Christianity as being restrictive instead of actually God showing us how to live life and be successful. So when a person breaks the laws of God, God doesn't just suddenly step in and punish you. He doesn't have to. He set laws in motion. One of the laws is the law of reaping what you've sown, and the other is that wherever there is breaches of the law of God, demonic spirits have a right to act. So when we break God's laws, two things can happen. One or several things happen. One, we're disconnected from God, and there's a place of darkness in our life. Two, we've opened a door for demonic spirits then to, to, to torment and access. And three, there's a reaping of what we've sown. So when Jesus said his first priority was the gospel, the gospel is the good news that Jesus has made peace with God on our behalf, and all legal rights can be canceled, all sin can be forgiven, all doorways that the devil could use to access us can completely be broken through repentance and confession. So it is good news. It's very good news. It is good news about God accepting me. It is good news about God welcoming me. It's good news about because of what Jesus did, you and I can be accepted with the Father. We can come to know the Father's love, the Father's embrace, the Father's acceptance. This is wonderful news that I don't have to perform hard. Jesus did it all for me. Colossians 2.14, he took away the list of everything contrary to us. All the sins, everything you've ever done, ever likely to do. He took it to the cross and in doing so disarmed principalities and powers. In other words, he addressed the issue that opens doorways for spirits into people's lives. So what great news. That's the first part of his ministry. And that's why he had to die on the cross was to break the legal rights that spirits have to access people and to deal with the separation between us and God. God's intentions, we'd be intimate. Most people just don't know how it happens. But God's plan is that you be intimate with him. And by being intimate with him, I mean this, that you are conscious of his presence continually. Rather than I'm only conscious when I feel good in a meeting when there's music and worship atmosphere. He puts a spirit in us so we can be conscious of God. You get the idea? I haven't got time to develop how you develop God consciousness in your life. But most people are sin conscious, conscious of faults, conscious of lack, conscious of something. And so they live trying to overcome that rather than developing an awareness. God is with me. He loves me. I'm forgiven. I can enjoy intimacy with him. And out of that place of being near him, that's how I get the victory. So there's a huge difference between being down here and I'm struggling to break through this pressure and problems and stuff to get to where I can get near to God. That's, a, that's how most people live. God's plan is we are joined with Christ in a place of victory. Now, how do I apply that victory to my life? It's his victory I'm applying to my life, not me battling to get a victory. Does that make sense to you? It, it, it's like a different perspective completely. So most people live conscious of what's wrong, not conscious of of God. And it's the consciousness of God will keep you out of the other stuff. So the question is then, if Jesus uh, came and was anointed to preach the gospel of how I can live conscious of God, then how do I make that part of my life? Done through faith, done through a number of ways. And I have to leave some of that for another time. The second thing it says, he sent me to heal the brokenhearted. Now, the Bible talks about your heart. It's not your physical heart it's talking about. It's talking about the center of your believing. With the heart, a man believes. So your head, you think. With your heart, you feel. With your head, you think and reason. With your heart, you believe. So your heart works differently to your head. Your heart flows. Your heart is intuitive. Your heart uh, works spontaneously. Your heart forms its own belief structures. And in Proverbs uh, 4, and I think verse 23, it says... 
uh, uh, out of the heart. Guard your heart because out of your heart flow the issues of your life. So most of us think we're so smart that we're running our life out of our head. But if you watch a person, you'll find if you listen to them for a while and observe their life, you'll notice what's in their heart because what's in their heart will come out their mouth. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Person's bitter, they can't help but give it away. You listen long enough, you'll hear it. In fact, you listen to someone. I just stood by you and watched you and listened to you. I'd know what's in your heart. You'll talk about it. If it's worry and fear, you'll talk about it. If it's uh, grief, you'll talk about it. If it's bitterness, you'll complain. I'll hear it. You understand what's in your heart will flow out your mouth. And Jesus said, it's out of the, the Proverbs, it says, guard your heart because out of your heart flows the issues or the borders of your life. Now, we think that our life is carefully planned and we've got it all organized and worked out. We don't realize that often it's actually the true track it's running is according to what's in our heart. So we need to understand what gets into your heart. When people, so when a person has a broken heart, a stranger doesn't break your heart. Strangers can do stuff that doesn't affect you. It's the people near to you break your heart. It's the people near to you damage you. So Jesus is talking about if a person's heart has been damaged, their capacity for intimacy with God is reduced. Their capacity for relationships is reduced. They need to have their heart healed. They need to address the issues that cause grief and cause the heart to be shattered. The word there is to fragment. So when a person gets hurt, they tend to bury the pain and then fragment that part of their life off. A person gets involved in a sexual relationship with someone, they become joined to that person, it doesn't work out because there's no marriage, covenant, commitment, and then they break up, then they fragment that part of their heart off. And so by the time they come into a marriage relationship, they've got their heart fragmented in so many different ways that intimacy with God and people becomes difficult unless this shattering of the heart is addressed. So when we get hurt, there's a response that we make. There's a number of things happen when a person's heart gets broken. I'll just come to that in just a moment. But notice the third thing he talks about is this. He said, he sent me to proclaim deliverance to the captives. So what that means, simply this, that he said that he's come to set people free who have opened their lives to evil spirits because of sin or because of life-shattering experiences. The demonic spirits enter people's lives primarily through two main doorways. One, through legal rights, through sin somewhere, and two, through emotionally traumatic or painful experiences. And once they've entered, they make it hard for the person to ever heal or recover until they're set free. So Jesus' ministry was to deal with the issue of sin, deal with the issue of the broken heart. That's why he carried our griefs and sorrows, just like he took our sin carried our griefs and our sorrows. And then he came to set us free from the empowerment of demons. Then the next thing says, recovery of sight to the blind. In other words, God wants to first of all reconnect us, heal the broken heart so we can believe and grow in our faith and intimacy, set us free from demonic spirits which energize the problems in our lives. When a person's got a spirit, sometimes they know they've got one, most people don't know because they think it's just me. That's just me. They've lived with the problem so long, they think, that's just me. And when you set them free, they feel, oh my goodness, I feel so much lighter. Something has left me. Sometimes people are aware when things leave them. That's the ministry of Jesus. Have a look and read through the stories in the New Testament. Find everywhere he went, he set people free. Straight after this in Luke chapter 4, verse 35, he's in a church setting and there's a man there tormented by an unclean spirit starts yelling out at him in the church. What's going on there? Well, he's got sexual sin. He's tormented with it and he can't get free. And in the atmosphere of the power of God, the thing starts to come out into the open and manifest in a church. There are heaps of people in churches who are struggling with sexual sin. And often the driving power energizing it is an unclean spirit. And they don't know that's what it is. And they wrestle and can't seem to overcome it because it needs a spiritual remedy not just willpower. Willpower is not enough to overcome. If willpower could overcome spiritual things, Jesus would never have needed to die on the cross. So then it moves on to getting vision, getting vision for our identity in Christ and our purpose in Him, uh, 
setting at liberty those who are, uh, are, are oppressed or crushed or limited, in other words, removing the limitations of our life and finally empowering us into our inheritance. So the scope of Luke 4.18 is far broader than you would have thought. We know the verse, but we haven't stopped to think. Actually, it's broken up into setting us free progressively from the issues that lock us up and empowering us to get fresh vision in our life. And with vision comes faith to become released from the limitations of wrong beliefs and then to be empowered by grace to actually get out and do something. When you look in Isaiah 61 that he quoted from it, it goes on to say, and they shall be repairers of the breach. They shall be the restorers of the desolation of many generations. They'll rebuild the old ways. In other words, God's plan, if you have been stuck because of sin, stuck because of emotional bondage, stuck because of limitations and bondage, whatever it is, God's plan is to set you free so you can bring hope to others. And yet, if we, if we don't deal with these issues, then we don't move forward. We remain stuck in a cycle of the same thing over and over and over and over and over. So if you find you're stuck in a cycle, something is driving it, stop just trying to behave your way out of it. Instead of that, start to look and ask God, what are the roots of it? Now, when people get hurt, let's go back to that one there. When people get hurt, there's a number of things they do in response to being hurt. Number one, people sin, they get angry. And anger is a way of controlling your world so no one can get near you to hurt you again. So some people get very angry and express it. Some people get very angry and internalize it. And with that anger that's inside them, they feel a sense of control. There's at least something there. And I found a lot of angry people in church for all kinds of reasons. And they've, they've, they've been told, you need to forgive. And they've said, okay, I forgive. <laughs> Jesus said, you've got to forgive from your heart. And to forgive from your heart, you've got to acknowledge the pain. And if you won't acknowledge the pain, because praise God, we're faith people. We don't acknowledge pain. We acknowledge victory. Well, that's nonsense. That's just denial. It's trying to control your way out of it. There's actually the balance in that, in that passage that the imparting of vision and empowerment and whatever comes after addressing the root issues the proper biblical way, which is never to deny them. It's to bring them to the light. So what, what do people do? So when people get hurt, they get angry, they hold uh, resentment, they hold grudges, and then they become bitter. And that bitterness affects them. And the Bible says, Hebrews 12, 15, a root of bitterness will defile all your relationships. I'll touch on some of that tonight and show you how if you don't address this issue in your life, then it'll keep you out of what God has ahead for you. There's a number of examples in the Bible. They never addressed this issue and they couldn't enter. So we've got a new day. If you want to enter the new day with all it's got, there's stuff you'll have to leave behind. Just because God opens a new opportunity doesn't mean everyone enters it. You enter when you understand what I've got to let go to enter the next season. So there'll be things to let go of. Okay, so number one, so number two is judgments, bitter judgments. Let me explain what a bitter judgment is. A bitter judgment is a judgment that you make, a decision you make, and it's usually made when you're very young, and it's made out of your heart, which is quite emotional, and it's made in a, in a, in a painful situation where you generalize something. So one man hurt me, my father hurt me. Never trust a man. All men will hurt you. All women will control you. All people in authority try and use you. And so it goes on. All Asians are this. All Maoris are that. There's all manner of judgments we make. And so when you make a judgment, you set in motion, you judge, now you reap in your life the very thing you've judged. The third thing that happens in people's heart is this, is that they form inner vows. And inner vows are a decision, I will protect myself, I'll save myself. And of course, if you don't know Christ, when these things happen to you, what else can you do but save yourself? So people say, I'll save myself. I will never be like my dad. I will never be like my mum. I will never marry like my like dad. I'll never trust anyone. I'll never have money. And so it goes on. These kinds of statements that create real problems in people's life because you forget you've made them and then later on they're working out in your life because your heart has become hardened in that area. And what's needed is for the Holy Spirit to identify the blocks so we can just repent and bring them to the light and deal with them. It's very easy to deal with them, but you just need to know that they're there. So very often people form inner vows. Sometimes 
Uh, another thing that happens is a um, uh, belief system, that we form beliefs about life, expectations about life. I'll be rejected. I'm dumb. I'm stupid. I'll never get anywhere. Those expectations are like negative faith. They pull all the wrong things into your life. So how do we get out of all of this stuff? Jesus came to get us free of it. The answer is you've got to come and recognize what the issue is. Holy Spirit, show me what's blocking me. Show me what's stopping me going forward. Show me what's in my heart that's causing these repeated cycles of failure in my marriage, failure in relationships, failure in, in any area, specific area of life. There's always, where there's a root, there's a fruit. Where there's a fruit, there's a root. You see an orange tree, there's an orange root there. So if you see in your life fruit of a certain kind that's unhealthy, there's something is empowering it. Ask God to show you what is the fruit. Is there some bitterness? Is there some area of sin inside my life? Is there some area of judgment I've made? Is there some inner vow I've made? Have I got some wrong belief system? A demonic spirit's got into my life. Did I open the door up in a moment of pain? Have I opened the door for things to come in to affect my life? And once the Holy Spirit's shown you that, then very simple. Lord, now I recognize what it is and take ownership of it. Instead of blaming everyone, I can now repent and confess it, bring it to the cross, and invite the Lord to set me free.